Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in. I wish now to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. We're currently on page 193 of the book. Yesterday we concluded our discussion about the confessional box and the authority of the priest both to hear confession and also to give absolution and uh, penance and issue penance. And one of those was a teaching of Thomas Aquinas, and we'll read this backing up part of a paragraph from where we left off yesterday because it'll be a, uh, a subject of discussion briefly before we continue the book. It says, in this connection, it is only necessary to say further that the Council of Trent in 1551 established the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas as a part of the faith by giving the power of absolution to the priests and continuing the system of allowing them, at their discretion, to compound to, to compound for sin by imposing pecuniary penalties. Now, I was challenged yesterday after the program by my regular Roman Catholic critic who says that he had never heard of the priest giving absolution by imposing pecuniary or monetary penalties to the penitent as a means of, of uh, doing penance. In other words, selling forgiveness of sin for money. And he challenged me. He'd never heard of it before. And my simple answer is this. The entire Protestant Reformation took place because of the sale of the forgiveness of sins for money. It was the Roman Catholic priest Tetzel who, raising money for St. Peter's Basilica, the new basilica that the papacy was building, went about selling indulgences and forgiveness of sins. We read examples of those in former books where one uh, uh, potential or pretended buyer of this indulgence asked Tetzel, can... I'd be forgiven of a sin I have not yet committed? And Tetzel says, yes. And he says, well, then I would like to uh, buy an indulgence for a sin I would not yet committed. And so Tetzel sold him uh, uh, an indulgence. And so Tetzel, leaving town with his money bag full, uh, his chest full of gold and silver that he had built from the people on the pretense of forgiving their sins and taking alms for the church, was ambushed by this man who had a premeditated crime that he wanted to commit, and he wanted to buy an indulgence ahead of time. And he was beaten by this man, and his, and his money was taken. And so Tetzel took him to court and sued the man for the money and for the beating. And the man simply stood before the judge and said, Here is my indulgence. I bought this. I'm already forgiven of this sin. And the judge upheld the, the indulgence. Now this idea of selling forgiveness of sins for money or for pecuniary interest, is what led to the Protestant Reformation. For any Roman Catholic to deny that their church sells absolution for money is beyond absurd. Did you hear me? It's beyond absurd. And it's only testimony to the blindness, the deafness, and the dumbness of Roman Catholics who are forbidden to hear the truth and are only bidden to come to the church and to hear what their church has to say about it. They're not allowed to read books. They're not allowed to discuss anything contrary to their church. 
anything that would hinder the progress of their church. And we're going to get into that as we continue in this book. But I find it absurd that a serious Roman Catholic who frequently challenges me on little details and yet ignores the vast ocean of evidence brought against the papacy and against the Roman Catholic Church and her history, both from the Bible and from history, never addressing any of those things, but only questioning that I dot my I's and cross my T's, and then use those minor equivocations as an opportunity to dismiss the entire ocean of evidence against the Roman Catholic Church. It's intellectual dishonesty. And that's the depth of the depravity of Roman Catholicism. That is the extreme to which they have to go to defend the indefensible. Now, I'll continue. It says, in this connection... It is only necessary to say further that the Council of Trent in 1551 established the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, one of the most powerful, revered, famous doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, one who set precedent, one who wrote voluminously about the Roman Catholic Church, one whose philosophies were inculcated into canon law, one of the most authoritative figures in Roman Catholic development was Thomas Aquinas, and that it should become a part of the faith by giving the power of absolution to the priests and continuing the system of allowing them at their discretion to to compound for sin by imposing pecuniary penalties. It was Thomas Aquinas, not Thomas Fress. It was Thomas Aquinas who made it a part of the faith that the priests be given power of absolution, taking it from the congregation of believers as in the Oriental Church, as in the Apostolic Church, and giving it exclusively to the Roman Catholic priesthood, and that their system of allowing them the discretion to take pecuniary interest for absolution was Thomas Aquinas' idea. And it was adopted in 1551 by the Council of Trent. My Roman Catholic critic does not know the writings and teachings of either Thomas Aquinas or the Council of Trent. Now, it says, the doctrine declared by this celebrated ecumenical council that God never gave to quote-unquote creatures the power to grant remission of sin until the coming of Christ when he became man. And in order to bestow, uh, in order to bestow on man this forgiveness of sins, when he communicated this power to bishops and priests in the church, having delegated to them his authority for that purpose, thus allowing that by the act of the Roman Catholic priest in prescribing penance or receiving alms and satisfaction for sin, the sinner is forgiven. And this, although the priest himself may be covered all over with the filth of his own personal corruption. And at no time in history is it more evident that these priests who hear confession, who issue penance, who give absolution, even sometimes for money, are covered from head to toe in filth. The world is now becoming aware of the global priest-pedophile pandemic, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. Now, beginning where we left off yesterday. When we consider what enormous power is thus acquired by the Roman Catholic priesthood and the requirements of them by the doctrine of papal infallibility, it's not surprising that they should have employed it in resistance to the laws of Germany, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland 
or that of the Bavarian Roman Catholics should have protested against it. Remember, the, the, these priests, these filthy priests, were using the sanctity of the, of the confessional box to lead revolutions in their various countries against the republican forms of government that were springing up as a result of the Protestant Reformation that was dismissing the authority of the Pope, retiring the authority of the Pope, at least the temporal power of the Pope, and the people were governing themselves. They were erecting governments of, by, and for the people with constitutions that protected the rights of the people so that the papacy could no longer rough, run roughshod either over the government or the people. So the priests, the papacy, through the priests, used the sanctity of the confessional box to stop the progress of this republican form of government that was springing up all over Europe, stripping the pope of his temporal power, using the sanctity of the confessional box to raise up rebellion against these governments. You talk about the sanctity of the, uh, the confessional box. There's a reason why the Pope insists on the, the confessional box being sacrosanct, untouchable by the civil power, because that's where he offers his resistance and, and attempts to regain his temporal power in the world. That's why it's a, it has to be a secret, what goes on in the confessional box. And, of course, the Roman Catholic citizens believe that they're giving private, personal information to the priests in their confessions and that it ought to be sanctified. But it works both ways. The priest can say whatever he wants in privacy, too even if it's revolution. Now, and when it is considered that this same power is now employed in this country every day and almost every hour by the same class of priests and for the same object, that is, the overthrow of our government, it is sufficient to excite both inquiry and reflection. The influence of the confessional does not vary with degrees of latitude and longitude. It is the same everywhere, putting the penitent completely in the hands of his confessor to be molded in his character and in all his thoughts and sentiments by the priests. While, while the bulk of the people of the United States are actively engaged in their daily occupations, unsuspecting and tolerant, the whole papal priesthood are devoting themselves morning, noon, and night to employment of this enormous engine of power in order to bring our Roman Catholic citizens, themselves unsuspecting also by permission, if or excuse me, by persuasion if possible, but by threats of excommunication if necessary, to the point of recognizing the infallibility of the Pope and the universal sovereignty which it establishes, knowing as they do, the conflict they are inaugurating with some of the most cherished principles of our civil institutions. Is there no danger from all this? There may not be and, and will not if we heed the admonitions coming to us from other nations with every flash of lightning through the sea. Let us begin in time to guard our national heritage. And while we're not required to do uh, anything in violation of the tolerant principles of our government, we can so shield them from the assaults of foreign imperialism that the blows aimed at them by their, assailing, uh, by their assailants will rebound upon their own heads. And that's the direction Inquisition Update would like to go. I'm not talking about armed conflicts with these Roman Catholic priests. I'm not talking about committing any sin of violence. I don't carry a sword. I don't preach a sword. I just preach the truth. 
and let the Spirit of God convict the hearts and souls of every man that he might do right in, before, in God's sight with regard to this Roman Catholic encroachment upon our liberties and the attempt to overturn our government and the liberties that it, that it is that it is to provide for the people according to the Constitution. These Roman Catholics that want to overthrow the government don't know what they're buying. What they should do is start asking the Roman Catholics of Europe about the history and how the Roman Catholics were the ones who rose up against the papacy and against the governments that were so oppressive, the papal governments that were so oppressive, and the Jesuits that constantly fomented wars with the Protestants. They rebelled against the Pope. They set up their own governments. And it's this that they would choose if they knew exactly what their popes were trying to do. They think God, they think God is manifest in the flesh through the Pope. And that whatever the Pope says is the Word of God on earth. And that they should obey without question, without conscience, without reason, just obey. But if they obey, if they do precisely what their Roman Catholic hierarchy insists they do, on pain of excommunication, then they are literally restoring those governments, those papal governments that were so widely rejected by Roman Catholics after the Protestant Reformation. Take heed, my Roman Catholic critic. I am not your enemy. I am the best friend you have. I'll say it again, Charles. I am the best friend you have. Now, we're going to move to chapter 7. Excuse me. Chapter 7, Pope Pius's war upon liberalism. And remember, liberalism represents democratic or republican forms of government. It represents Protestantism. It represents liberty independent of the Pope's temporal power. Con freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of Bible societies to print and distribute the Word of God to the people, freedom in Christ, freedom to worship God, not according to the dictates of the Pope, but according to the written Word of God, the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit, guiding by one man's conscience. That's what liberalism means to the papacy, and it is his most vicious opponent. Okay. In this chapter, chapter 7, as I said, we're going to be dealing with the encyclical and syllabus of Pope Pius IX. My Roman Catholic critic tells me, oh, Pope Pius IX is kind of insignificant these days. We, we, uh, we really don't take him too seriously, and and we've really kind of uh, rejected what he said. <laughs> then explain why President George H. W. Bush stood before the world at the uh, at the uh, State of the Union address and talked about the new world order. <laughs> if we're not following Pope Pius the Ninth, then why are we talking about the new world order and a State of the Union address by the President of the United States? A papist, you better believe the encyclical and syllabus of Pope Pius IX is of, of supreme interest for people in this country who know there's something wrong in the world that they just can't figure out what it is. And we're going to talk about that encyclical and syllabus of error of Pope Pius IX in 1864. It's an important subject, and that's why I'm reading this book. We're also going to be talking about the doctrines of the, of the syllabus of error. It includes bulls and other popes, the doctrines of the syllabus, opposed to modern progress, that is, modern Protestantism, or everything that came out of the Protestant Reformation, 
We're going to talk about the doctrines of Boniface VIII, the Council of Trent on crimes of the clergy, and the bull unum sanctum uniting the spiritual and the temporal swords. When you look at the Vatican flag, you see two keys. They represent swords, actually, the temporal and spiritual swords of the Pope. Now, obviously, if they use swords on the papal flag, you couldn't hardly call it a Christian flag, could you? <laughs> so they simply replaced the swords with keys. And after all, the Bible, the Bible talks about keys, doesn't it? All right, the present pope has practiced no disguise, and we're talking about Pope Pius IX now, the one who wrote the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864. He's been the subject of this book from the beginning. The present pope has practiced no disguise in exhibiting his opposition to the liberal and progressive, in other words, Protestant, spirit of these times. Disavowing all purpose of compromise, he courageously confronts its advocates and grapples with them. He presses his followers forward into the battle, which he and they carry on with exceeding fierceness, showing no quarter and asking none. No victory has been won by them thus far, but only discomfiture and defeat. Remember, Europe rebelled against the papacy. They enjoyed republican forms of government. They had dismissed or retired the temporal power of the Pope. So the Pope was being met with defeat all over the world. Only the United States was standing up in defense of the papacy, but not for here, but for in Italy and France, remember. We've been discussing this. Thus, in a sense shooting themselves in the foot because what they were advocating for Italy and France was directly contrary to the liberty they enjoyed under our Constitution, which gave them the liberty to rebel in the first place. Now, yet all this, even the terrible blow that has been struck at the papacy by the Roman Catholic people of Italy, has only converted their ardor into passion and their courage into desperation. Every step they take makes it more and more a death struggle. If liberalism and progress shall be overthrown, that is, if Protestantism shall be overthrown, the papacy may rise up again out of the wreck. If they survive the contest, that is, if the Protestants survive the contest, in other words, if the mortal wound sufficiently heals that the papacy can raise itself up to a temporal king once again in the world, if they survive the contest that will result from that, in other words, if the Protestants once again defeat the papacy, no human power will be able to breathe new life into it. R.W. Thompson realized that the deadly wound inflicted against the papacy during the Protestant Reformation was being healed right before his very eyes, and that it was going to eventually lead to another conflict. I call it an inquisition. And if Protestantism wins that contest, Romanism will never raise its ugly head in the world again, because it'll be a war of annihilation. But I think God's going to take the victory right out of our hands and do it himself. Now, R.W. Thompson is talking about an eventuality. This at a time when, he's speaking at a time when the papacy was defeated. The mortal wound was gaping. The Pope had been put back in his box. The people were free, set up their own governments. And the papacy responded in fulminations and damnations and excommunications, papal bulls and encyclicals, this being one of them, the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, damning all liberal, Protestant dem democracies and republics in the world that dared to stand up against the Pope's temporal power 
and strip him of his temporal sword and make him a mere priest. The papacy redounded with the encyclical and syllabus of error. Pope after pope after pope in succession damned the direction that the world was going and did everything it could to preserve and to restore that temporal power to the pope. And R.W. Thompson perceived the day when the Pope would again carry that temporal sword. He said, if liberalism and progress shall be overthrown, that is, if Protestant sh Protestantism shall be overthrown, the papacy may rise up again out of the wreck. If they survive the contest, that is, if the Protestants survive the contest, that's right, he called it a contest, and every time Rome goes to contest, she resorts to bloodshed. R.W. Thompson, I assert, even envisioned the Inquisition that's coming to the world when the papacy once again carries that temporal sword. There's going to be a contest, and it's going to be a bloody one. If Protestantism survives the contest, it'll be a matter of life and death, trust me, R.W. Thompson fully understood this, fully conceived, perceived this, and is trying to relate it to us right here. If Protestantism survives the contest, no human power will be able to breathe new life into Roman Catholicism. Now, left to mingle with the debris of fallen nationalities, it'll be known only by the, by the history which shall record its wonderful triumphs in the past and point out the cruel bondage in which it held mankind for centuries. That's right. Roman Catholicism, if the Protestants survive the contest, Roman Catholicism will be rendered to the, tra to, the, to the ash bin of history. And it will only be remembered for its wonderful triumphs during the Inquisitions and the Dark Ages, its crusades, and that will reveal the cruel bondage that the papacy put mankind under for so long a time. I don't intend to wait for those days. I intend to preempt those days with the truth by reminding God's people of the cruel bondage which the world suffered at the hands of the papacy when he ruled supreme over this world before that fatal, that mortal wound was inflicted during the Protestant Reformation. We've got a reason to fight. Because our lives are at stake, our liberties are at stake, our Bible is at stake, our faith is at stake, our country is at stake. While the whole world's talking about the assault on Christianity in this country, I'm talking about the assault on Protestantism a subject which very few will even dare to talk about because it divides Protestants and Catholics as though there was something wrong with that. The Lord said, Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. But the ecumenical evangelical bellies say, No, let's go to bed with the whore. Unity, peace. And they'll say unity and peace while the papal sword's coming to destroy them and to destroy me. I'm not going to sit down and be quiet about it. Now, the Pope understands all this. He understands that if papists, if, if, if the Protestant, if, 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 if his papal encyclicals and bulls and syllabuses are responded to properly by Roman Catholics, and this inquisition begins to take place, if the Protestants win, 
The papacy's toast. Roman Catholicism is toast. We went through one Protestant Reformation. If we have to go through another one, it'll be to the death. Now, the Pope understands all of this. And with all his pontifical energies aroused to the utmost, is preparing for the grand and final contest. You tell me R.W. Thompson in 1876 didn't recognize what the papacy would do to achieve a new world order or a restoration of the old? He says the Pope is aroused to the utmost and is preparing for the grand and final conquest. He throws into it all the weight of his private virtues, which no uh, adversary has assailed, and the pledge of his personal honor, which none have impeached. In other words, this man is going after his object, and he has no personal foibles to discredit him. And it says, as the space between the, combat the combatants is narrowing, you can't get much closer than Catholicism and Protestantism right here in the United States of America. He says, as the space between the combatants is narrowing, he claims the power of omnipotence that he may mold all his followers into compact and unbroken columns with but a single impulse in every heart and but a single thought in every mind. He invokes the aid of the Almighty Arm, capital A. But the voice of his invocation dies away amidst the, the desolation of imperial Rome. That's right, he wants to champion a war here in the United States. But Europe is already proclaiming his defeat. He says he tries to, sh he tries to shake the earth with the thunders of excommunication, but its terrors have departed among the thousands who once shrunk from it as from the wrath of God. As a last resort, he is endeavoring to break down the lines of separation between all the nations. That's right, a one world. No national sovereignties, no national borders, a one world order. R.W. Thompson understood this back in 1876. Listen again to what he says. As a last resort, the Pope endeavors to bring down the lines of separation between all the nations and to resolve the world into one great, quote-unquote, Christian commonwealth, a grand, quote-unquote, holy empire, unquote, subject to his single will and bowing before his single scepter. Now, there's no other way to interpret this than that R.W. Thompson perceived the New World Order better than we do today. That the papacy is going to create a global Christian commonwealth a holy Roman Empire, and every man, woman, and child on the planet will be subject to his single will. And they will bow only to his scepter. No other king. The Pope will be king of kings and lord of lords if God allows it. That's how far the papacy intends to go. A, a one-world order. And, of course, we're all going to have to acquiesce because he's also going to have a one-world economic system. And if you don't go along with this, they simply punch in the right keystrokes on the computer and steal all your money from your phony bank account. Deny you health care. Deny you the privilege of traveling deny you the right to own private property and to give sanctuary to yourself, you'll be a vagabond on the earth, living from the dirt. That's what the Pope has in store for us. I call it Inquisition. And every program is an Inquisition update. 
The Pope claims authority by the virtue of divine appointment. Yes, he believes he's been appointed by God to enter every nation, to defy every government, to break the allegiance of every people, and to pluck up by the roots whatsoever he shall find that bars his progress to universal dominion, says R.W. Thompson. He sends forth his summons to all the faithful, that is, all the Roman Catholics and all those of good will, according to Pope Benedict XVI. He sends forth his summons to all the faithful throughout the world and commands them to rally under the papal flag. Under the papal flag, not their own national flags, under the papal flag, to turn their backs upon all other banners, including the United States flag, and to prepare for a grand crusade that shall rescue Rome from the apostate spoiler. Protestantism. Of course, in this case, he's talking about Victor Emmanuel, but on a global, on a global scale, he's talking about Protestantism. That's right. We're preparing for a grand Holy Roman Crusade to rescue Rome, that is, the papacy, the Vatican, from the apostate spoiler, from Protestantism. That is the New World Order. R.W. Thompson saw it as though it had already occurred. He says, and if the honor, the glory, and even the lives of their own nation shall stand in the way, all these must not be of a feather's weight compared with the mighty triumph which is to be won in God's name when the imperial crown shall once more sit upon the papal brow. That's right. Every Roman Catholic in contemplation for the establishment of this new world order must consider his own nation but the weight of a feather. In, compares, in, in comparison to the glory that they will endow upon themselves when they crown their Pope King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and Roman Catholicism becomes this, the world religion. Pretty uh, motivational speaking, isn't it? Did you hear it, Charles? What side are you going to be on? Choose you this day who you will serve, your Pope or God. He says, we've seen enough already to satisfy observing minds in reference to all these things, but they have too intimate relation with the present condition of the world to be passed by without more detail. Pope Pius IX, however much we may resist his efforts to restore the papacy, is on account both of his official and private character entitled to our respect in such a degree that if we have misjudged his purposes and designs, a full and frank statement of them should be made so that whatever error shall exist may be corrected. To this end, therefore, it is necessary that an analysis of the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864 should be made, as these celebrated officials' documents were issued ex cathedra, in other words, infallibly, and undoubtedly contain the most authoritative expositions of the papal policy. Yes, Charles tells me that the Roman Catholics really don't take Pope Pius IX too seriously today. But it was issued ex cathedra from the throne of Peter, so-called, and with the quality of infallibility. Don't tell me that Roman Catholics don't take Pope Pius IX seriously. You may be talking about a few of the laymen of the Roman Catholic Church, but you're certainly not talking about the Roman Catholic hierarchy that controls them lock, stock, and barrel. And when they want to pull out Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, they'll do it, and you'll go along with whatever they tell you. And if they tell you to rise up and kill the quote-unquote heretics, which is interpreted to mean Protestants, you will find yourself, Charles, in making a critical decision in your life. Because Pope Pius IX damned Protestants 
And the Council of Trent said it is no crime to kill a Protestant, that they should be extirpated from the whole earth. Charles, before you die, you may be making a very critical decision based on Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error. Don't try to tell me that that encyclical is put in the back drawer. The encyclical and syllabus, we're taking a, 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 a brief note here by the author. He says, The encyclical and syllabus of 1864 are both now accepted without further disguise or question as ex cathedra. Charles, a recent work discussing this subject emanates the various modes in which the Pope addresses the faithful in such a way as to command their assent on the score of his infallibility. The author says, an example of this is furnished by the syllabus of error put forth by Pope Pius IX in 1864. Then after quoting from the encyclical, he says, now surely an encyclical containing passages like these, which are even stronger in their content than their extracts, has every mark about it of an ex cathedra or infallible procurement. When does the church speak infallibly? By Thomas Francis Knox, London Oratory, page 94 and 97. It was given with the air of infallibility. It is law in the Roman Catholic Church. It is futile to try to convince me that at the very least the Roman Catholic hierarchy take him as seriously as, they, as though he were God himself. Now, this examination may be premised, however, by the, by the mark that there is a wonderful discrepancy between the doctrines set forth in these papers and those which the Pope was generally supposed to entertain at the beginning of his pontificate. He did then undoubtedly express some liberal sentiments and indicate a purpose to make some important concessions to the people of the Papal States. Yes, the Papal States were tired of the heavy yoke and bondage of the papacy, and they were sick and tired of the Pope's temporal power, and they too wanted to liberate themselves, although they were the Papal States, you know. So the Pope was going to try to make some concessions for them, some liberal concessions, to ease the Papal yoke, to withdraw the temporal sword just a little bit, And it says, but then it was understood that he was not under the control of the Jesuits or the ultramontane clergy and was disposed to deal kindly, or at least in moderation, with the liberal sentiments then prevailing among Roman Catholics of Europe, especially in Italy and under the influence of which they were gradually moved toward the establishment of Republican governments. In other words, at first, at the beginning of his pontificate, Pope Pius IX wasn't altogether condemnatory of some of these liberal tendencies brought about by the Protestant Reformation and was willing to make a few concessions to keep the coffers full. But then came the Jesuits and the Ultramontanes, and it says, some of his enemies accused him of insincerity in making these concessions. Oh, anyone would dare die that the Pope would lie? It says, some of these enemies accused him, some of his enemies accused him of insincerity in making these concessions and insisted that they were the result of his fears of personal violence. However this may have been, he was soon turned from his liberal course by events which seemed to have thrown him into the arms of the Jesuits and to have placed him in direct antagonism to the European liberals of his own church. 
That's right. The Jesuits corrupted him. They turned him from a conciliatory pope to a king of kings and lord of lords, a dictator. Now, it says this cunning and compact order, we're talking about the Jesuit order, has succeeded in indoctrinating his mind so thoroughly that their ideas of ecclesiastical and civil policy, the, uh, with their ideas of ecclesiastical and civil policy, that the remembrance of what he was once disposed to do in behalf of popular representation seems under their teaching to have driven him in the, opposite, in the other extreme. So they turned Pope Pius IX 180 degrees away from liberalism and concession to dogmatic Romanism. And it says his assumed infallibility brought about by them, by the Jesuits, this is a direct accusation that the Jesuits were the ones who called the Council of 1870. They were the ones who dreamt up the papal infallibility. They flattered the Pope. You're infallible, and we're going to declare it as dogma. You're the representation of God on earth. And how can any duly appointed representative of God on earth ever speak error? You must be infallible. And all they did was consolidate power in the, in the papacy so that they could more easily control the church. Remember, a new world order was their goal from the very beginning, to make the world Catholic. That's what the Jesuit order is all about. And the Jesuits just can't have the papacy making concessions to Protestants when the Jesuit order is sworn to destroy Protestantism and all Protestant forms of government. See, once in a while, the the, the the, the Jesuit order has to take a stick and kind of whack the Pope once in a while to get to be too friendly to the Protestants. Okay? Got to whack him around a little bit. Well, they whacked Pope Pius IX. They corrected the Pope. No, you'll not make concessions to the Papal States or to anybody in Europe. We're going to rule the world and you're going to go along with it. And then make sure you do, we're going to call you infallible. We're going to make it a dogma of the Roman Catholic Church in 1870. And by dog, you better go along with it. Or we'll take you out. So, Pope Pius IX conceded. The First Vatican Council was called. He was declared infallible. Many Roman Catholic prelates voted no, but they passed it anyway. And the Jesuits have forged along with their new world order under an infallible pope. And we're nearly at the finish line, and Protestants still aren't waking up to the reality. It all hinges on papal infallibility to try to heal up the wound that was inflicted by the Protestant Reformation. We'll continue tomorrow on Inquisition Update.